Master and Margarita, part one. Well now, who art thou? A portion of that power that wills the bad and works the good at every hour. Goethe, Faust. Chapter one. Don't you ever talk to the strangers? On a spring day, when a blaze sunset was burning in Moscow sky, two men were working along the Patriarch's ponds. One of them was short, plump, bald, dressed in a grey summer suit, and he carried his pork pie hat in his hand. He was clearly shaven, and he wore gorgeous black horn-rimmed spectacles. The other one was a young, broad-shouldered man with a mop of red hair with a cocked checked cap on. He wore a cowboy shirt, crumpled white trousers and black shoes. The first was that very Mikhail Alexandrovich Berlioz, the chairman of one of the largest literary associations in Moscow, known as Mesolit, and the editor of a bulky literary magazine. His young companion was Ivan Nikolaevich Ponerov, the well-known poet Bizdomny. They approached the shadows of fresh green lindens, and first of all they rushed to the bright-colored booth beverages. In the terrible May evening it was strange not to find a living soul either near the booth or on the paths of Malaya Bromna Street. Dry heat of misted sun was leaving Moscow in an unbearable tense and faded behind the Sadova Irin. No one came up to sit down in the shades of the lindens. The path was empty. Give us two glasses of Nazan water, please, asked Berlioz. No, Nazan, answered the woman in an offended voice. Do you have some beer? inquired Miss Domine hoarsely. We'll resume some in the evening, she said. What do you have then? questioned Berlioz. Warm apricot water. Soda. Okay, give us some. The water was frothy and the air smelled of hairdresser sprays. Having drunk, the writers started to hiccup. They paid for the drinks and sat down on a bench in front of the pond with their backs towards Bronner Street. There happened another strange thing to Berlioz. Suddenly he stopped to hiccup, his heart sank and, he, and it gave him a feeling of a blank pain. Besides, Berlioz was seized with an unreasonable, uncontrollable, overwhelming fear to run away from the patriarchs for the hills. Berlioz turned around as if he didn't understand where he was. He turned pale, wiped his forehead and thought, What's wrong with me? Never occurred before. Something's wrong with my heart. I'm overstrained. I guess I should clear the hell out to Kislovodsk. All of a sudden, a thick, heated air formed into a leaping strange man in front of Berlioz. The stranger was in a tight-checked suit, short jacket, and with a jokish cap. A man of a great height, but extremely narrow-shouldered and lean. He was staring at Berlioz with his mocking eyes. Berlioz was not used to such supernatural world phenomena in his life. He got even paler, stared at the man and thought, it can't be real. However, that lean man was real and he was swinging to the left and to the right in front of Berlioz, not touching the ground. Berlioz got frightened even more. He even closed his eyes. When he opened them, he noted that everything was over. Blank pain left his heart too. Oh shit, exclaimed the editor. Ivan, you see, I've nearly escaped a stroke because of this heat. It was like hallucination. He tried to grin, but his eyes expressed alarm and his hands were trembling. Gradually, he calmed down, found himself with a handkerchief and uttered rather frisky. Well, let's get down to our business. He came back to his speech before drinking. As it became known later on, when it was all over and completely in vain, Berlioz was speaking of Jesus Christ. The editor ordered poet to write an anti-religious poem for the magazine. Ivan Nikolaevich wrote it quite quickly, 
but the editor didn't like it at all. In editor's opinion, Bizomni showed the main character in a very gloomy way, and the poem needed to be completely rewritten. Thus, the editor was lecturing about Jesus to show Ivan's main mistakes. We don't know what exactly failed Ivan, whether his talent or his complete ignorance played a trick on him. But Jesus turned out to be absolutely alive in his poem, though not very attractive. Berlioz wanted to prove that history had no importance how good or bad Jesus was. The point was that he didn't exist as a person and all the stories about him were a pure myth. The editor was a very educated person and in his speech he cited ancient historians such as Philo of Alexandria, Flavius Josephus, who never wrote of Jesus. Showing great competence, Mikhail Alexandrovich said that in the 15th book of chapter 44 of Tacitus' Annals, the fact about execution was inserted much later. The poet listened to the editor very attentively, staring with his curious green eyes, as he had never heard of those things before. Sometimes he he cupped, cursing apricot soda water. It is described in every Eastern religion that a virgin gives birth to a god, said Berlioz. So Christians created their own god in the same way, but in fact he had never existed. It should be the key point in your poem. Berlioz's high tenor sounded lonely in the deserted path. He got more and more sunk into his own words, and the poet learned more and more interesting and useful facts about Egyptian Osiris, the god of sky and earth, Phoenician god Tammuz, Maduk, and less known Aztec Mexican god Witzli Putzli. When Mikhail Alexandrovich was telling the story about creation of the figure of Witzli Putzli, the first mysterious figure appeared in the path. Afterwards, different authorities published a lot of information about that man. Actually, it was too late and in vain. Comparisons could amaze. In one version, it was mentioned that a person was not very tall, but he had golden teeth and he was lame in the right leg. In the second version, they wrote that a person was of great height, he had crowns and platinum, and he was lame in the left leg. The third description informed that a person did not have any special features. We should admit that none of these notes were true. To begin with, a person was not lame at all, but he was tall. His crowns on the left were in platinum and on the right in gold. He wore an expensive grey suit and foreign shoes of the same great color. Grey beret was, choked, was cocked on one ear. He carried a walking stick with a poodle head black knob under his arm. He looked 40 years old. His mouth was curved with arrogance, face was clearly shaven. He had dark hair, his right eye was black and the left one was green. Eyebrows were black but one was higher than the other. A foreigner, no doubt. Approaching the bench where the editor and poet were sitting, a foreigner looked at them, stopped, and sat down on a neighboring bench. German, Berlioz thought. Englishman, thought Bizdomny. Hmm, doesn't feel hot in the gloves. The stranger glanced at the high blocks of the flats, squaring the pond. He evidently saw the place for the first time, and it evoked great curiosity in him. Reflections of the broken sun in the high stories caught his eye. Unfortunately, Mikhail Alexandrovich would have never seen them again. The foreigner looked to the lower windows, where, which were getting dark with the evening shadows. He smiled leniently, screwed up his eyes, put his hands on the knob and chin onto the hands. Ivan, you've written satirically of Jesus' birth. In fact, Many godsons were born, like Phrygian Atis, but nobody of them had ever existed, just like Jesus. I need you to write not about the birth, 
but about wandering rumors of his birth. Judging by your story, we may think that he was really born. Bizdomny tried to end up with the damn hiccup. He held his breath, but he cupped even more loudly and agonizingly. At that very moment, Brillio stopped his speech as the foreigner stood up and came up towards them. The writers looked up at him with surprise. I beg your pardon, the foreigner started with an accent, but not killing the language. I let myself, without being acquainted by the subject of your scientific conversation, is so interesting. He took his beret away in a polite way. Thus, the colleagues had to rise up and bow. A Frenchman made up his mind, Berlioz. A Pole, thought Bizdomny. The stranger produced an awful impression upon the poet, while Berlioz felt intrigued. Would you be so kind to let me sit down? asked the foreigner politely, and the pals impulsively made the space for him to sit down. He adroitly settled down between them and joined the communication. If I got you right, you said Jesus did not exist. The stranger seemed to get interested, looking at Berlioz with his left green eye. Yes, you got it right, politely answered Berlioz. We have just discussed that. How interesting, exclaimed the foreigner. What the hell does he want? thought Bizdomny and got frowned. Did you agree with your interlocutor? inquired the strangers, turning to Bizdomny. All hundred percent. Bizdomny preferred artificial and metaphorical manner of speech. That is so amazing, cried an undesirable participant. Thievishly toned and dropped his high voice. Pardon my obtrusiveness, but as I've understood besides other things you don't believe in God. He made terrified eyes and kept on. I promise I would not tell anybody. No, we don't believe in God, laughing at the foreigner's fear pronounced Berlioz. But you can say it quite freely. The stranger settled back and asked, screeching of curiosity. Are you atheists? Yes, we are, smiling said Berlioz, while Bisdomny thought in anger. Stuck completely. That is so amusing, cried out the foreigner, turning his head to one and the other literators. In our country, atheism does not astonish anybody said Berlioz in a diplomatic, polite way. The major part of our population has consciously ceased to believe in these myths about God. At that moment, the foreigner did something strange. He rose up and shook the shocked editor's hand, pronouncing, Please accept my most sincere thanks. What do you thank him for? asked Bizdomny, blinking with astonishment. It is a very important information, which is valuable for me as a tourist like me, uttered the strange man with an impressive look, raising his finger. This information seemed to produce a significant effect about, upon the traveler as he started to look around at the houses, as if fearing to see an atheist in each window all around. He is not an Englishman, kept on Berlioz while Bizdomny got gloomy. I wonder where he's learned Russian so well. Still, let me ask you, after a lament silence pronounced a foreign guest, what should we do with the five proofs of God's existence? Alas, added Berlioz with sorrow in his voice, none of these proofs is valuable and mankind Put them aside long ago. You should agree, reason has no argument for God's existence. Bravo, cried foreigner, bravo. You've just repeated the idea of an anxious old man, Emmanuel. Here's the audit. He destroyed all the proofs and then, as if mocking at himself, created his own sixth proof. Ken's proof? objected a smart editor, is also unconvincing. 
Even Schiller wrote that those words could satisfy only slaves, while Strauss simply laughed at them. Brewers was thinking and thinking. Who is he? What is he? Why does he speak Russian so well? That Kant should be sent to Solovki for three or even more years for such proofs, unexpectedly burst out Ivan Nikolaevich. Ivan, whispered Berlioz in embarrassment. This suggestion to send Kant to Solovki made foreigner delighted. That's it, that's it, he cried, and his left green eye pointed to Berlioz was twinkling with joy. That's the best place for him. Once you are in the breakfast, I told him. As you wish, professor, but you have invented something ridiculous. Perhaps it is smart, but too vague. You will be the object of irony. Berlioz could not believe his ears. Breakfast? Can't. What is he talking about? Unfortunately, the stranger continued without paying attention to Berlioz's astonishment and talking to the poet. It is absolutely impossible to send him to Solovki just for the reason that now he is in a far more distant place for more than 100 years than Solovki and we can't take him out of there. Believe me. What a pity, said the bully poet. Indeed, confirmed the unknown person with the glittering eye and kept on. But I am concerned with one question. If God does not exist, who is in control of a human life and the order on the earth in general? A person is in control, Bizdomni angrily hurried to reply that vague question. I beg your pardon, gently echoed the stranger. If we are to control, we need a plan for some certain period. So let me ask you how a person can be in control if he is devoid of the possibility to arrange a plan for an absurdly short period of time, for example, a thousand years. Besides, he does not know what will happen to him the next day. Really? He turned to Berlioz. Imagine, you start to rule, order, control others and yourself. You start to enjoy it. And some day you have a, um, well, lung sarcoma. A foreigner smiled as if lung sarcoma gave him great pleasure. Sarcoma. He screwed up his eyes like a cat, repeating a sonorous word. Here's your reign is over. No one destiny but your own has the importance for you. Relatives start lying to you. Suspecting something awful, you rise up to the doctors, charlatans, fortune tellers. Everything is in vain, and you understand it perfectly well. It finishes tragically. The one who seemed to have been in control lately turned out to be lying in a wooden box, and people understand that he is no longer of use, burn him in the incinerator. Sometimes it can be even worse. A person is planning to go to Kislovodsk. The stranger glanced at Berlioz. Very simple. But he can't do that because all of a sudden he will sleep and find himself under a tram. Do you want to say that he controls himself to that very way? I suppose somebody else has made this control for him. <laughs> and the foreigner laughed in a very strange way. Berlioz listened to the unpleasant story of sarcoma and tram, and anxiously some alarming thoughts start to appear in his mind. He is not a foreigner, he is not a foreigner, thought he. A very strange person. Stop. Who? What is he? I see you want to smoke, the stranger addressed Bizdomni. What cigarettes do you prefer? Do you have a variety of them? asked the poet gloomily. He did, he did not have any, while well, he wanted to smoke. Which cigarettes do you prefer? repeated the unknown. Well, our mark, angrily murmured Bizdomni. The stranger slowly took out his cigarette case and offered to Bizdomni. Our mark. 
Both editor and poet were amazed not only with the availability of our mug in the cigarette case, but with the cigarette case itself. It was of enormous size of pure gold and opened with a triangle diamond sparkle of white blue lights on its cover. The writers thought differently. Berlioz, a foreigner, Bisdomni. What the hell is he? The poet and the cigarette case owner smoked. Berlioz refused, as he did not smoke. I should object to him the following way, decided Berlioz. A person is mortal. It goes without saying. The matter is, he could not put his thoughts into words as the foreigner took the floor. Yes, a person is mortal, but it only half of the problem. The problem is sometimes he is mortal all of a sudden. That's the point. And he can't say for sure what he will do in the evening. A very strange form of the question, pondered Berlioz and objected. I think it is an exaggeration. I know my plan for tonight more or less precisely. Unless a brick falls on my head on Bronna. A brick can't fall, solemnly interfered the unknown person, on anybody's head itself. Never. It won't fall for any reason at all. I can assure you that you are safe from it. You will die another death. Perhaps you know how I'll die? inquired Berlioz with a natural irony, getting involved into the silliest conversation. Would you be so kind to tell me? Eagerly, answered the stranger. He looked at Berlioz as if he was going to sue a suit for him, and murmured, One, two, Mercury in the second house, moon is away, six, grief, evening seven, and declared loudly and joyfully, Your heart... Your head will be cut. Miss Domney angrily and wildly stared at the stranger, and Berlioz wondered, smiling crookedly. Who? Enemies? Foreign spies? No, answered his interlocutor. A Russian woman. Come some old member. Well, mumbled Berlioz, irritated with this joke. You see, it is very doubtful. I am sorry answered the foreigner, but it is true. With your permission, I'd like to ask you, what are you doing tonight if it's not a secret? It is not. Now I'm going home to Sadova. Then at 10 p.m. at Masalit, I'm holding a meeting where I'm a chairman. It is impossible, firmly objected the foreigner. Why? Because, responded he and screwed up his eyes towards the sky, where black birds were circling in the evening fresh air. Anushka had already bought some, flan, some sunflower oil. More than that, she has already spilled it. So the meeting won't hold. There fell silence under the lindens. Excuse me, after the pause spoke Berlioz, looking at the foreigner talking nonsense. What sunflower oil? What Anushka? All is of no importance, burst out Berlioz, declining what to the undesirable participant. Have you ever been to the madhouse? Ivan, softly exclaimed Mikhail Alexandrovich. Nevertheless, the foreigner was not offended and laughed heartily. Sure, I've been there pretty times, he exclaimed, laughing, glaring at the poet with his serious eye. I have been to so many places indeed. I wish I had asked a professor what a schizophrenia was. You'll have to ask this, Ivan Nikolaevich. How do you know my name? For goodness sake, Ivan Nikolaevich, who does not know you, the foreigner took out the previous day's literary paper issue and Ivan Nikolaevich saw his own photo in the front page and his poems below. Yesterday, he would have been enthusiastic about this proof of fame and popularity. Now, his face turned dark. Excuse me, could you wait a bit? I want to tell my friend a couple of words. Surely, exclaimed the unknown person. It is so pleasant here under the lindens. By the way, I am not in a hurry. 
Look, Misha, whispered the poet to Berlioz aside. He is not a foreign tourist. He is a spy. He is a Russian emigrant. Let him show his paper or he'll be away. You think so? Alarmingly whispered Berlioz and thought to himself. Of course he is right. Believe me, the poet spoke hoarsely. He is making a fool of himself to learn something. You see how he speaks Russian. The poet was speaking and watching the stranger. Let's go and stop him or we'll lose. The poet pulled Berlioz back to the bench. The stranger was standing near the bench, holding some book in a darky gray cover, an envelope and a visiting card. I beg your pardon that during our hot discussion I've completely forgotten to introduce myself. Here's my card, passport, and the invitation to come to Moscow for some consultation, pronounced the stranger, penetratingly gazing at the writers. They felt embarrassed. Damn, he heard everything, thought Berlioz, and showed politely that there was no need on it. While the foreigner was showing the documents to the editor, Ivan managed to see the word professor in Latin and the initial letter of the second name started with a W. My pleasure, the editor murmured perplexedly and the stranger pulled the papers back to his pocket. The relations were restored and three men sat down again. Are you invited to us as a consultant, professor? asked Berlioz. Yes. Are you German? inquired Bizdomny. Me? repeated the professor and thought. Well, I think I am, concluded he. You speak Russian very well, noted Bizdomny. Oh, I'm a polyglot and know a lot of languages, answered professor. What is your profession? inquired Berlioz. I am a specialist in black magic. Bah! occurred to Mikhail Alexandrovich. Are you invited to us in this capacity? stammered he. Precisely in this capacity, stated professor and explained. They have found authentic manuscripts of practitioner Herbert of Orillac of the 10th century in your state library. I was wanted to research them. I am the only specialist in this sphere. Hmm. Are you a historian? With relief and respect, asked Berlioz. I am the historian, confirmed the scientist and added suddenly. Tonight, an interesting story will take place at the Patriarch's Ponds. The editor and the poet were surprised. Professor beckoned them, and as they bowed, he whispered, Remember, Jesus existed. You see, Professor, said Berlioz with a forced smile on his lips. We respect your competence, but we have another opinion upon this question. You don't need any opinion at all, responded the strange professor. He just existed. That's all. There should be the proof, began Berlioz. No proof needed at all, said professor. He spoke quietly and his accent vanished. Simple as it is. In a white cloak, 